Jared Edelstein here, your celeb expert and your celeb savant. Celeb Savant is a weekly entertainment show. We have long-form career retrospective type interviews with celebrities, singers, actors, and industry experts. He's one DJ that has been there, done that, and done it all again. And for almost three decades, Judge Jules has led the way in the world of dance music. Since hitting the decks in 1987, Judge Jules has influenced an entire generation on KISS FM and Radio 1 and continues to be on the playlists of millions with his weekly radio show, The Global Warm-Up, which notches up to 750,000 downloads every single week via his podcast. As a pioneer of the club scene, passion and persona behind the decks coupled with crowd connection and unrivaled mixing has earned Judge Jules unforgettable sets at the world's most iconic clubs and festivals, including Gatecrasher, Ministry of Sound, Global Gathering and Creamfields. In the studio, Judge Jules has released over 100 tracks and his mixed compilations for Ministry of Sound, Universal and Warner Brothers, which have racked up over 3 million sales. Earning his place amongst DJ legends, Judge Jules has received accolades such as number one DJ by Mix Mag, Best International DJ by Dawn Star Awards, Best Radio DJ by Smirnoff's Dawn Stars, and has consistently featured in the DJ Mag Top 100 poll, peaking at number three alongside the industry's greatest. Up next on Celebs Vant, we've got Judge Jules. Where do we find you in the world? How are you doing and what's happening in your life? Uh, well, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm one of these very strange individuals who has spent a lifetime of being a DJ and music maker. But about 10 years ago, I set up my own uh, specialist music law practice as well, where I look after mainly people in the dance and electronic music world. So at the moment, I'm sat in my office. It's a more sedate and more uh, <laughs> uh, serene environment than if, I, if you caught me behind the deck somewhere. <laughs> Why did you choose the alias Judge Jules? Now, let's. Does anybody choose their own alias? That's the question. Mm, yes, um, I think the best alias. The best uh, is the plural of alias alii. Let's let's pretend it is because it sounds <laughs> yeah. funny. Uh, the best alii are uh, chosen for you by your friends. Okay, uh, and it, we we go back to the age of about sixteen to eighteen. I got into. DJing by promoting illegal parties. At the time, I was a law student. And my friends, what are you when you're young? You're brave and you're quite stupid. And I was both, dare I say it. And <laughs> when the police turned up to our numerous illegal events, I was always thrust in front of them, uh, telling the officers who turned up to our very large illegal raves that I, it was a party officer for my law student chums, which, of course, was complete a complete concoction. Yeah. And for that reason, my friends gave me the moniker, the judge, and it's stuck ever since. Ah, uh, that's cute. I like that. So now let's you, you've tapped into or touched on it a little bit. So let's rewind to your beginning in the entertainment industry. So at what age did you decide, cool, I love music, I love the entertainment world, I want to s progress into that world. And how did that journey accumulate to where we are today? It's, it's almost a given when you are uh, in, if you aspire to be in the music industry, um, that you've got to be an absolute geek, you know, really, a, a geek and a fanatic. And, you know, when you're young, you don't want to call yourself a geek. And as you get older and become more comfortable with your in your own skin, it's acceptable to acknowledge the fact that you probably are a bit of a geek and, <laughs> and were since, since, since day one. So, you know, I had the biggest record collection. It was back in the vinyl era um, in my immediate social circle. We used to just spend all our waking hours and all our hard-earned hard sort of pennies, even from the age of sort of 11 or 12, going and buying records, both new and old. And and that becomes, if you like, the epicentre of your social life when, you, when you're 13, 14, 15. But of course, as you get a bit older and, and I don't know, relationships and all, all the rest of it come into your life, you, you think, well, you know, this is this is becoming a little bit embarrassing, this obsession. I need to do something to kind of justify my, my addiction. So, um, DJing and wanting, but also wanting to share the music that you love with people because music's a very music's a social thing, isn't it? So, yeah. we started putting on parties um, age sixteen. Actually, I found a couple of venues that were prepared to turn a blind eye here in London to oh, underage, uh, predominantly underage clientele who were sort of getting drunk and well, I wouldn't say they're falling all over the place because it was more about the music, but you know, um, 
And what you don't realise at the time is that that is the point in your life probably where you will have the largest social circle because mm. nobody at that age has really got anything to do. Um, um, but there are lots of them and, you, and friends of friends hang out and, and it really all sort of blossomed from there. We started putting on events. Um, I then went to university when I was 18, got into pirate radio and started putting on um raves for you know for overage people albeit only marginally overage um and that's expanded over a long period they the, the, the events got very successful we did lots of them they were in and around various areas of london during an era in the late 80s where it was a lot more derelict kind of industrial um properties where yeah. one could hold these things in in relatively central London. Now, if you wanted to find those sort of derelict properties, you'd have to go miles out of the city yeah. to do so. Um, and it and it blossomed from there and it and it generated various other, if you like, lanes to my career of doing more radio, doing more pirate radio and then getting into legitimate radio, doing more music making and and generally just cutting my teeth as a DJ and feeling more comfortable, more comfortable in front of a crowd because yeah. I don't think anybody is going to be immediately comfortable um, in front of a crowd. You need to get used to it. You need to understand the dynamic. You need to feed off the off the crowd. And um, and I think I picked that element of it up quite early. I mean, I'm, I'm in my fourth decade of DJing. These days I do probably 80 to 100 gigs a year, which I still find quite astonishing. Not that one is ever complacent and one needs to work hard and mm. one is only as good as one's last gig. But I think that that degree of kind of feeling comfortable and feeding off the crowd and feeding off the energy of the crowd is very difficult to explain unless you've actually lived it and experienced it because it's it's a unique drug. It's a unique, you know, it's a, it's unique petrol in your engine. You mentioned that you picked up the energy of the crowd at an earlier on in the career. What was the thing that helped you realize, okay, cool, I'm picking up this energy and what is it that you have to be aware of of the crowd in order to understand it? Well, I, I suppose, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I mean, first and foremost, you've got to have fairly good ears for the right records, because if you haven't, you're, you're, it's a non-starter. Yeah. Um, and, you know, assuming that sort of basic um, bedrock of being a successful DJ, you've got to realise that you've got to understand the ebb and flow of the crowd. You've got to understand that some crowds are more hungrier for brand new unheard music some crowds are a bit more commercial and, and there's every shade in between those two sort of mm -hmm. polar opposites and you know i'm lucky enough not to have to do too many shows where they're exceptionally commercial and i've probably never been a dj that's been at the absolute ice cold underground end either i've always sat somewhere in the middle yeah and it's but it's understanding that dynamic and understand and having the right weapons in your musical arsenal to kind of Kind of deal with those situations because there's always an ebb and flow on every dance floor even in the world's greatest clubs and festivals there's always a bit of an up and down whether you can see it numerically in terms of numbers of people on the dance floor or whether you feel it more just from the general energy vibe there's always peaks and troughs yeah. and it's understanding those and being able to kind of manipulate those so that people walk away at the end of your set saying wow and you know metaphorically open mouthed to create a set for a events or an evening or whatever what goes into that creation and does the energy of what's happening in the room sometimes change what you performing and what you playing always it always does okay. i am um, i never really pre the, the work as a dj that one does is done before you even take the decks it's yes. being it's knowing the records within your record box having thought about either strategically or organically knowing what's going to work together and then it's like a rubik cube that never requires the same solution you uh, occasionally at some really big events where you've got a very limited time you know what those those kind of big festivals where you might have a shorter set than normal like an hour where you've got to make an immediate impact and yes. might have two or three the first two or three records prepared but yeah. beyond that you've simply got to I, I think the skill in the D, of, of any DJ is knowing what to play and putting it together in the right order, spontaneously. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's yeah. A, bit, a bit of an opposite there. Knowing what to play, but being spontaneous at the same time. I like that. You mentioned earlier on about pirate radio and our tr normal or traditional radio. So for the listeners, listeners who do not know, what is the difference between the two? 
And is there either one that you prefer personally? Well, pirate radio is illegal radio that's um, not licensed. Um, okay. In in the UK, operating in certain major cities, particularly in London, on the FM band, generally generally speaking, filling a market that's not catered for is it, I I've got a lot of time for. And in my youth, there was certainly a, there was a very strong gap in the market playing records that. Rep, rep, represented UK and particularly London club culture, club and yeah. rave culture, that just weren't getting a look in anywhere else. So the, the pirate radio was, just to confirm, was a place to play those that type of music that wasn't being featured on other uh, anywhere on the radio um, at all. Is that correct? Yeah, filling a gap in the market. But it's also, there's an element of anarchy about pirate radio where some of the rules didn't apply, you know, t- arguably talking in the wrong places on the record and not... Yeah. Not everybody talking with the same voice. I think, you know, having having regional or having like London accents now doesn't matter at all. But there was a long period where you almost had to sound like the stereotypical BBC presenter to even get a look in on, on legal radio. So obviously then pirate radio, radio perceivably could be freer in the sense that there's no sort of structure. You're creating your own flow. Yes, there were most most of the more successful pirate stations then and now have a certain amount of advertising, albeit there's not there's only so so many brands that generally smaller brands that um would be prepared to advertise with pirate radio. So there's a bit there's a bit of kind of uh structure to it. It's not totally turn up and you know, finish when you want. You know, there are show oh, okay. there is there's a show schedule and there's but you're not sort of measured by the traditional um mm. I don't know, uh, Ray, Ray Jar, which is the way that we measure radio uh, listening figures here in the UK, for example. There's no focus groups that, yes. whereby uh, the, the, the broadcast kind of corporation will sit certain radio shows in front of the focus group and decide whether they like them or not. There's none of that stuff. Are there still pirate radio stations today or is that not a thing anymore? There are, yeah, there are some in London still, yeah. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. okay. That's interesting. Now let's let's go into your... Uh, other career, your law. You, uh, what elements of law do you practice, and how do you assist in the dance DJ world? Well, it's it's music and entertainment. I negotiate. I mean, basically, I negotiate deals and contracts from beginning to end. Um, okay. And there are uh, there's a massive spectrum, really. And anything music related, if there's a music deal to be done. Uh, and there's a huge spectrum of different music deals that can be done. I can do it for people. Um, okay. I'm sort of specialising, specialised in contracts and in, dare I say, being a bit of a hustler uh, on on, uh, on the people I represent's behalf. From that, what is your feeling? And I know this is a controversial topic. So, what is your feeling around AI and specifically in the music industry? AI has been the buzzword, obviously, in life as in music for about the past 12 months. And there's a lot of stuff that AI can do. It can replicate vocalists, singers' voices. You can you can record vocalists. You can re- singing and spoken word. In theory, you can write songs. Um, but I think there is, there is an inbuilt limitation to AI, um, which is that most of the style-leading creatives, uh, let's talk DJ producers um, to talk particularly about my world yes. are always quite ahead of the game so if you were to go and hear some of the world's leading DJs they'd be they'd be playing the music that they're making that will be released in three to six months time that's what you'll hear in their DJ sets AI can only replicate what's out there in the marketplace now so okay. uh, AI can't predict that the, the, way, the way that a creative's mind is going to work going forward they can only replicate what a creative's mind is going to do now and of course in at a, at a mainstream level, that might be enough. But most people who love the arts are into those people who are prepared to take chances and who are who are two steps ahead. And AI can't, uh, to my knowledge anyway, do that that element of it very well, which means there's only a limited extent to which AI can replace the true tastemakers of the world. I agree. There's human creativity and emotion that a robot will never be able to replicate or feel or do. You've obviously played at massive festivals and smaller venues like in clubs. So the difference between the two, obviously your energy and energy input into what you're doing is the same, but what is the difference for you? And is there one that you prefer more than the other, you know, massive festival compared to like the smaller venues? I think 
in an ideal scenario, over the course of a couple of months, you want to be doing a bit of both. Smaller venues have the sort of whites of their eyes, the ability to take more chances, uh, just feeling a, a, a closeness with the crowd, which mm. is really what I get the biggest buzz out of. It's not just playing the music, it's the, the proximity of the crowd. Whereas at some festivals, the majority, in fact, you're up on a stage, there's a crash barrier at the front. So there's always a sort of a fairly significant gap uh, between you and and the crowd, which yes. is, it is what it is, because uh, it's generally a very big crowd. So you've got that kind of feeling of an enormous amount of people in front of you, but you haven't got the closeness and the kind of whites of their eyes connection. With your music, do you create your own music or do you only sort of do remixes of other artists or combination of both? A bit of both, yeah. I mean, I do, I play other people's records. I play my own remixes of other people's records, my own, especially my own one-off versions that I just keep, I create for my own DJ sets only. And then I make my own records as well, a bit of everything. You want to, it's it, it's difficult, especially when you've been around a long time. You've got, um, my market is predominantly sort of over 35s, although that doesn't mean that I don't have a young audience there as well. But that's the, that's where my my predominant market lies so you don't want to upset the people who've known you historically but at the same time you don't want to be i don't know tom jones rattling out the same old hits at the same time so (laughs) so the challenge is to be original and uh relevant um to 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 a new market meanwhile kind of incorporating elements of things that have that people might have loved about you in the past okay so now let's dive into creative world when you're taking a song by another artist and you're remixing it and you creating your own spin on it. What inspires you to choose certain songs or certain records to uh, uh, remix? And how do you approach that? Well, the choice is very often based on things that haven't been, you know, raped and pillaged before, really. Um, <laughs> yes. the, because there are certain records that have been remixed so many times. Oh, yeah. I don't know, Mr. Bright, Mr. Brightside by The Killers or... Uh, Seven Nations Army, I'm, t- I'm stating the most glaring, the obvious one, Seven yes. Nations Army or things like that. So you want to steer clear of the obvious. Um, you want things that have got an element of familiarity that haven't been absolutely remixed to death by everybody else. Ideally, things that haven't been touched at all. And there's, if you, so you need to think hard about it. And often you get a kind of eureka moment listening to the radio or just... And you just, you know, to put it, you you put a note in the notes section of your phone and you think, yeah, that one is going to work amazingly well. And it's particularly relevant for uh, the summer uh, festival season. I'd I'd say, and I, I, and this applies to, this applies to many other DJs. We probably two thirds of our work is is in one third of the year, which, or a little bit more than one third of the year, you know, May through September is where, the biggest concentration of gigs is and that's when all the big gigs take place so you've you've almost got to sort of prepare for the summer season doing more of those sort of tracks than you otherwise would and then in terms of what the creative process is you've just got to have if you like a mind's eye it's funny my uh family members some of my family members play grand gta grand theft auto which has got you know one of the world's biggest games i'm not much of a gamer myself but they've yeah. got this i don't know if you're familiar they've got this all this clubbing stuff in there where they show you a couple of famous DJs have obviously lent, lent their moniker to it. And you see these kind of identical kind of clubs that the, that the gangsters in the game go into. And you've almost got to have like this mind's eye image of, of a, almost a gamer version of what a festival's like in your head. Okay. And then create a record that you think is going to work in this, in this uh, surreal gamer version of a festival. Um, so you're, it's almost like you roll all the festival and big gig experiences into one idea and, and try and create something that's going to work in that environment and that's that's the best you can hope for and most of the time you play it out and it works sometimes things need tweaks and you go back in the studio the, one of the great luxuries of being a dj stroke music maker that we all have those of us that have enough gigs is the ability to test records in front of people yes and some things just work immediately um and hopefully experience will enable you to create things that do work immediately but the reality is there's a huge difference between the way something sounds in your home studio mm-hmm. and the way it sounds with the on a big set of speakers um it's a, it's a different environment but the luxury is the ability to go go away and sort of tweak stuff once you've done it for a first time and is it the same approach when you're creating your own original music or what is your approach with that 
Well, it depends what you're trying to do with original music. I've always had, I've always been a relatively genre agnostic. I like lots of different areas of music. Most, uh, there are many other DJs who are a little narrower in their, in what they like doing. I, whereas I like them with quite a broad spectrum of music. So first and foremost, it depends what you're trying to do. You know, whether you're doing, trying to do something more listening orientated, uh, I, might, I might make certain records I'm focusing more on a listening angle, you know, slightly more chilled angle and other things that I'm doing directly for the dance floor. It, it depends. I guess it's, you know, part of that is dependent on what uh, what else is in your record box in that given month, whether yes. you're almost trying to fill, fill certain gaps in a record box that aren't catered for by what is out there. You mentioned earlier on about that energy and that feeling sort of being a, the addiction Beyond that element, what keeps you going, performing, being on stage, DJing? What other elements do you enjoy about it? It's all I've ever known. You know, it sounds <laughs> yeah. crazy to say it, but, you know, the thought of having to sit at home watch, watching Strictly Come Dancing on a Saturday <laughs> night, is, yes. it, which I've never done, is, is motivation enough. It's, since, I, since I've been an adult, I've spent... I've probably not had more than four to six Saturday nights at home per year okay. in, in all of that period. You know, we're talking in decades. So yes. I'm, I'm institutionalized to be going out and traveling and meeting new people. And it's, it's not just about the set. You know, it's meeting the promoter, being courteous to the person who's paid you to be there, having a conversation, finding out about their life, finding out about the club, finding out about the venue, finding out about the history of the promoter, who yes. the crowd are, how often, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's not just because I'm do I'm not just doing it to be polite. I'm genuinely interested yes. because I'm a you know ambassador. It's probably blowing my own trumpet a bit too far, but I'm somebody who believes in our scene enormously and mm. cares about the way that the the late night, well, not even late night, the, the sort of clubbing stroke festival market, particularly in the UK, is prospering. So you know, it's all it's it's part of a bigger picture, really. I tend to turn up quite early before my sets when I DJ um, uh, generally leave immediately afterwards because you sort of you want to leave on a high you don't want yes, to sort of be it. sat there waiting for an hour <laughs> yes. as, as the kind of vibe and the adrenaline just dissipates into nothing so but I always get to my my every gig pretty early an hour at least if not if not plenty more I know if I had to ask you this question in two minutes two hours two days I know your answer will be different every single time I recognize that and appreciate that but if you had to push play to five songs by other artists once we finish this conversation what would be the what would be those five songs and by whom i i guess we're talking classics because if you were if you're asking me about current records i'd need to dig through my uh dig through my current dj folder um uh -huh. art of noise moments in love okay because it's the original it's the original chill out records uh the clash london calling because i'm a life you know i'm a born and raised Londoner and I think it's the best record about my home city and yeah. my favourite football team come out of the tunnel every uh, every match to the get to the, the track as well um, Joe Smooth Promised Land because I think it's uh, one of the greatest songs that's ever been immortalised on a house record um, Eric B and Rakim Paid in Full the Cold Cut remix because yes. it was one of the it was the original sample record that's just how they cleared or you know putting my lawyer head on alone how they cleared all those samples on the record and let's think of another one um i suppose energy 52 cafe del mar because it was the original yes. sort of trance record that kind of opened the door to a genre that was hugely successful i love that list jules the podcast is listened to throughout the world so as a final message to the audience what would you like to say please explore me <laughs> sounds, <laughs> sounds quite cheesy please explore me not in the physical sense in the digital sense in the digital sense 